Thank you. Good morning, and welcome to Neighborhood Unitarian Universalist Church in Pasadena. Welcome to all members, friends, and guests here in person and virtually. My name is Mae Colcord, and I'm a member of your Board of Trustees. <laughs> <laughs> Neighborhood Church creates and grows an inclusive community of faith connected by love, spirit, and service. We acknowledge our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples, the traditional caretakers of the lands and waters of this campus. With respect for the rights and wisdom of indigenous people, we acknowledge our harmful colonial histories and commit to decolonizing our own practices to learning new ways of being in community and with each other in good relationship with the indigenous people of this land and with the land itself. Today's service is led by our guest, Tongva tribal member, Mona Morales Recalde, and senior minister, Reverend Dr. Omega Burkhart, with music by Michael Whitehorse Avilas, music director, Dr. Zaneda Robles, and Wells Lang. Please take a moment to silence your devices as we begin our service. Thank you for joining us as we continue to prioritize connection over perfection in this hybrid service, which is streamed and recorded on YouTube. Families with young children are welcome in the sanctuary or the narthex. Today at 1.30, we are having our congregational new ministry startup workshop here in the sanctuary. We will explore the minister congregation relationship with the guidance of Sarah Gibb Millspa from the UUA. We strongly encourage you to stay and participate in person, but if you can't, please find me or James Coombs for the Zoom link. And if you're watching online, you can email James at president at neighborhooduu.org. Um, today also, Christmas pageant auditions will be held at 1 p.m. in Ross Chapel. All children and youth ages eight to eight 14 are welcome to audition. Contact Zaneda or Matt with any questions. Our order of service and more extensive announcements are available as a link in the Sunday email posted in the narthex or through the QR code on the back of your hymnal. You can always get more information on these and many other activities at the welcome table. Again, welcome to Neighborhood Church whoever you are and wherever you are on your spiritual journey. Welcome to this inclusive faith community connected by love, spirit, and service. Many of us are grappling with the devastating events unfolding in Israel and Gaza this week. Even as we may hold complex and contradictory feelings, about how these events came to pass. We also mourn the suffering of our distant siblings, and we mourn that peace seems so far away. May we not turn away from the suffering of others, but may we also turn towards nurturing ourselves and our communities with justice centered in love. If you would like a tender space to grieve or to pray or to find solace with others, you are invited to join us tomorrow for an interfaith, multi-faith candlelight vigil on our labyrinth at 6.30 p.m. That's Monday evening at 6.30. This is not a space for declaiming or taking sides or blame, rather a space for siding with love in grief, and in a prayer for peace. Please join us.
Please welcome our guest musician, Michael Whitehorse Aviles. Good morning. Good morning. Or was it afternoon? I don't even know anymore. <laughs> Any anybody here at the last service? You were oh, okay. Then good. You didn't. <laughs> they would never hear this before. First song I'm going to do is called. Ancestors Call, I composed it in 1994 after a dream I had about my grandfather. So originally it was Grandfather's Call, but I changed it to Ancestors Call, honoring the ancestors. And I'd like to welcome all of you to Tong Vanar, which means in our language, the world. And uh, the word Tongva means earth. So I am Tongva Vit, I am from the earth. So this is Ancestors Call, and it's a conversation between myself and my grandfather.
As we gather this morning, let us be a people of not forgetting, writes my colleague, the Reverend Karen Johnston. Let us practice holding collective memories that might otherwise slip into that enormous void that sucks and corrodes any future we hold dear. Let us practice honoring truth-telling up from the past that must come fully into the now, lest we falter and fail, lest the whole remain in pieces. Let not our need for comfort or simplicity, for easy forgiveness or false pardon, smother the heartbreak that still needs healing. Let us practice resilience with reckoning. Let us marry memory and promise. Let us dance in the tension that we find there. Let us rest in the integrity we cultivate there. Let us be partners with the possibility that emerges there. It is good that we gather. Come, let us worship together today. Robin, would you like to come forward? Good morning. So about a year ago, after listening to James and others read the Tongva land acknowledgement, I began to wonder about the history of the tribe as well as the current situation of the people. With the help of Ben Lopez, who is a docent at the Autry Museum of the American West, I found out about the Kuravungna Sacred Springs on the campus of University High School in West LA. I was born in Northeast Los Angeles in 1950, and I've lived here all my life, but I never dreamed that a natural artesian spring could still exist in the middle of our dense urban environment, producing 25,000 gallons of water per day, even at the end of a dry summer during a multi-year drought. It's beautiful and magical, and it has been the heart of a traditional gathering place for thousands of years for the Gabrielino Tongva tribe of Mission Indians. <clears throat> Excuse me. I remember that as children growing up in the 50s, we loved cowboy and Indian movies. And I was fascinated by the lives of these California ancestors, how they lived, what they ate, how they made their homes, the jewelry they wore. And I remember that as elementary school students, we were taught about the mission Indians as a historic people who had eventually been wiped out by European settlement, disease, and assimilation. We understood that some of the faraway tribes like Navajo, Apache, had somehow survived, but not the local native Tongva. I don't even remember hearing the name Tongva. I visited the Kuravungna Sacred Springs and spoke with tribal elder Angie Behrens, who originated the museum there, and received a bottle of water from the Sacred Springs from Bob Ramirez, who oversees the gardens. Within a month of my visit to Kuravungna, we welcomed Art Morales, an elder of the tribe, and his daughter, Mona Morales Ricaldi, who is the Native Community Elected Commissioner of the Native American Indian Commission. And they told us of the beautiful and painful history of Southern California's early people. I remember Mona emphasized the simple words, we are here. I think most of us listened with a sense of awe as we started to become aware of the complexity of the Tongva's history and their present, including the elusive nature of federal recognition and the hopes for reclaiming some fraction of the land that was once their domain. They participated in Share the Plate, and we spoke on the patio of dreams 
of a native plant garden with plants used to make baskets, as well as plants to eat. But when Deidre Price became our coordinator of social justice, she organized the committee of volunteers who developed the relationship between neighborhood and the, tr and the tribe, leading to today's visit. Members of the committee and other volunteers have prepared a small sampling of native foods using ingredients from our California plants like chia, mesquite, stinging nettle, rose hips, and agave. And we invite you to taste these items on the patio after the service. So grab your coffee or some stinging nettle tea, and we'll see you. Our opening hymn is number 1098 in your teal hymnal or on the screens above. Please rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing number 1068, Rising Green. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Matt Vasco, Neighborhoods Director of Spiritual Exploration. And I also have the pleasure of being our pageant director. Thank you. So I just wanted to make a quick mention about our pageant auditions today, as you might have heard mentioned in our announcements. They're at 1 o'clock in Ross Chapel. And anyone who is a reader, is welcome to try out for a speaking role. And if someone is maybe not a reader yet or is young and would like to be in the pageant, um, we have 
a really fun role at the end of each pageant to help form our tableau, we need some stable animals. Uh, not emotionally stable animals, I mean like <laughs> animals that live in a stable. So, you know, cows and sheep and things like that. And we have adorable costumes for them. So even little ones are welcome to have a role in our pageant. And my rule is always everyone who tries out gets a part. So if you come to auditions today, you'll get a part. Uh, we only do auditions to help assign roles. And with that, will the children and youth please come forward for a story for all ages? Don't be shy, come on down. There they come, all right. Grab a stump, grab a piece of log. Excellent, excellent. Our October spiritual theme is heritage. And of course, when we talk about heritage here in the United States of America, we need to talk about our native peoples who are native to these lands because they have a long and rich history with the land. The Tongva people who are native to this campus that we dwell on are, have been caretakers of this land for 10,000 years. So we need to honor our native peoples as we are doing today. And this book, is about native peoples. It's called We Are Water Protective Protectors, written by Carol Lindstrom, illustrated by Michael Goad. And it is a Coldicott award-winning book, which means it's got really pretty pictures. You have that book? All right. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. Good. Water is the first medicine. Nokomis told me. We come from water. It nourished us inside our mother's body. It nourishes us here on Mother Earth. Water is sacred, she said. We stand with our songs and our drums we are still here. The river's rhythm runs through my veins, runs through my people's veins. My people talk of a black snake that will destroy the land. Spoil the water, poison plants and animals, wreck everything in its path. A black snake. When my people first spoke of the black snake, they foretold that it wouldn't come for many, many years. Now the black snake is here. Its venom burns the land, courses through the water, making it unfit to drink. Take courage! I must keep the black snake away from my village's water. I must rally my people together. To stand for the water, to stand for the land, to stand as one against the black snake. We stand with our songs and our drums. We are still here. It will not be easy. We fight for those who cannot fight for themselves, the winged ones, the crawling ones, the four-legged, the two-legged, the plants, trees, rivers, lakes, the earth. We are all 
related. Tears like waterfalls stream down, tracks down my face, tracks down my people's faces. Water has its own spirit, Nokomis told me. Water is alive. Water remembers our ancestors who came before us, she said. We stand with our songs and our drums. We are still here. We are stewards of the earth. Our spirits have not been broken. We are water protectors. We stand. They're all holding signs that say things like, water is life. All nations protect the sacred. Stand with standing rock. No D-A-P-L. No Dakota Access Pipeline. And then at the back, the book has Earth Steward and Water Protector Pledge, which we can all take. I will do, I'll read it. I will do my best to honor Mother Earth and all living things, including the water and land. I will always remember to treat the earth as I would like to be treated. I will treat the winged ones, the crawling ones, the four-legged, the two-legged, the plants, trees, rivers, lakes, the earth, with kindness and respect. I pledge to make this world a better place by being a steward of the earth and a protector of the water. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. That's our story, kids. Have great classes. We'll sing you out. Don't forget to put your log back. is a spiritual practice through which we put our values into action. Each Sunday, our congregation dedicates 100% of its contributions to a local social justice organization or activity. In addition to the plate, online giving is available using the QR code on the donations box just outside the sanctuary or using the text instructions shown on the screen. If you wish to make a payment towards your pledge or contribute to church operations, make a note in the subject line or use an envelope available at the donation box. This week, our gifts go to Side Streets Project. Here to tell us more is Alex McAdams. <laughs> Founded in 1992, Side Street Projects is a mobile artist-run organization that supports artists, projects, and programs to foster leadership through socially engaged art in a DIY, do-it-yourself, and DIT, do-it-together ethos. They connect artists and communities in facilitating dialogue, collaboration, and creative problem solving within a hands-on art-making context. They employ community-centered artists to teach in local schools and in the community and work to fill in the gaps in service in our community. Through programming that promotes creativity, well-being, and the potential for collective growth, they work to provide equitable access to the arts and address the needs of artists, youth, and the community at large. To learn more about this organization, you can visit their website at sidestreet.org. We hope you'll give generously to the artists at Side Street Projects.
May the volunteers please come forward. We thank you in advance for giving generously. Jazz it up a little bit. That was fun. Thank you, guys. <laughs> I said that was fun. Miha netwatnane Mona Morales Recalde. I'm going to share reading and reflection with you, please. This comes from Corinthians. Certainly, the body isn't one part but many. If the foot says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not a hand, does that mean it's not part of the body? If the ear says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye, does that mean it's not part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, what would happen to the hearing? And if the whole body were an ear, what would happen to the sense of smell? But just as God, our creator, has placed each one of these parts in the body just like he wanted, and if all were one and the same body part, what would happen to the body? But as it is, there are many body parts but one body. I share this with you because we all have our own individual perceptions, and they are like lenses that we carry based on our own personal life experiences. When we hear news stories or we get, get new information, we process that based on our own perception of our own individual experience. And part of being in a community is being able to have a shared experience or a shared perspective beyond just our own. 
So I share that with you from the perspective that we as individuals participate in communities. Being here, we're sharing time and space, we're in community. Each one of us has something individual that we participate in, whether it's a book club or a pickleball or whatever it might be. And in those experiences or in those places, we all carry our own perspective and we bring our own gifts and we bring our own opinions and views. But it's important that we realize that we're a part of a bigger community and that we're all connected. And in that connectedness, that's where there's power. And so being a part of the body or being a part of community does not mean that we're cut off from each other. If anything, it means the opposite, that we're combined and all in one. And we're meant to have experiences and share our perspectives so that we can participate and be part of something greater and bigger. So how I like to say it very directly is that it's our ability to care for others and want a healthier community depends on our own willingness to be more than we are on our own. We need each other's perspective. Thank you. Next I'm going to do is uh, called Raven. It's off my record or album, whatever you want to call it. It's a conversation with Raven and the experience I had in 2014. Big, big old fat Raven came and was he was messing around. He's met, he were, so I started talking to him and back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And so when I went to back to this area to monitor, Raven wasn't around. So I said, I call out Raven, and you'll hear it in the first notes. And I say, Raven, you came to me in a summer's day. Where did you go, Raven? Raven. So it's a conversation, like, what happened to you, you know, that kind of thing.
you my so it's me again. Um, so I am here to share with you and talk to you about the Tongva community um, and the power of community and our individual perceptions. Next slide, please. What I always like to start with is a picture of our ancestors and our future generations. And the reason is, as Native people, we think in terms of seven generations so that we look back, we honor the present with where we're at now, and we also look forward. So I have pictures here of past ancestors as well as some pictures of children of future generations of the Gavilino Tongva to represent the fact that we are here and also give proper respect to the ancestors and the future generations that will carry this message on in the future. Next slide, please. Um, so the information I'm going to share with you is the best of my knowledge, and I come in a good way, and please know that we have a very troubled history that's very complicated. And I come with the perspective of healing and trying to move things forward in a good way, and so that's the intention of what I have in the information that I'm sharing with you. I thought it would be a good idea for you guys to know who you were speaking with. So normally I don't do a slide on me individually, but I thought it would be a good idea to help you guys understand um, who, who, you're, who you're hearing from. So um, I grew up knowing I was Native. I didn't have to have someone tell me, oh, you're Native American. It was a part of our life. Um, my dad was the chief in the 70s, and so we grew up going to Native um, events, functions. It was a part of our life. Um, we had different opportunities that it presented, like in the 90s when they opened up the Native American Smithsonian, we went and represented the tribe in Washington, D.C. for that. Um, most recently, this year, um, I spoke at the Getty with, they had an employee um, function, and so my sister and I spoke at the Getty where we were able to share about our people and the ancestral land that the Getty set, sits on. Um, and most recently, this week in, with Indigenous Peoples Day, I was in the LA City Hall Chambers receiving the Indigenous Peoples Day certificate, which I actually brought with me. I'm on my way to a tribal meeting after this, and I, share, I brought that with me, so it's out there on display for you all. So we're actively involved in the community, um, and as an elected member of the Native American Indian Commission, what that means is that there are five seats on the commission that are elected by Native Americans in LA city and county. And it's a voting process just like any other mayor or any other type of role. And so I'm an elected commissioner that represents the Native American Indian community on that commission. So um, I often say I hold, you know, I'm a commissioner and then I'm also here speaking as a tribal member as well. Next slide, please. Um, our, our tribe holds the government-to-government -government relationship. So Rob Bonta had a um, swearing-in ceremony, and our chief did the blessing and land acknowledgement. Um, and uh, the Democratic Party had a w convention in the end of May, and so our chief is the one that did the welcoming and blessing for that. And so we're very active in the community as, in ensuring that the representation is there and that we're carrying the message we are here. Next slide, please. So Gavilino Tongva, um, these are our village sites. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about our history. So we basically cover the greater Los Angeles area and all the way to Southern, El Southern Orange County down to Aliso Creek and up towards the mountain areas as well. It's estimated, depending who you read, it's 100 or 200 villages that we had in the area. I just go with 150 because it's down the middle. Um, <laughs> but um, most of the villages were one day's walking distance from village to village. Um, but this is a good map or a good representation that shows um, shows our area. Gaviolino um, comes from the San Gabriel Mission, so Gabriel is from from that. And then Tongva, as Mike said, it's people of the earth, and this whole area is known to our people as Tovangar. Next slide, please. So there's sometimes questions about the naming and how things came to be. So this is a document from the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, from the Bancroft Library in Berkeley. And there were two main historians that recorded our people and our history quite a bit. And it was Harrington and Hugo Reed. And Hugo Reed did marry a Gavilino Tongva woman. And so that was a big interest or reason why. And he's a Scottish man, but a lot of his records are give us a lot of insight into our own history. Um, Back to that slide, if you don't mind, real quick. Um, the other thing just to mention on this is that um, things that are commonplace words that you might hear but might not know that they're Tongva words, Kawanga, Topanga, Rancho Cucamonga, anything with an NGA is likely a Tongva word, but you just probably didn't know it because we don't share that, right? <laughs> um, next slide, please. Okay. So this is um, a representation of us. Um, 
that was done in an artistic view of what life was like pre-colonization. I often say that this was living our best life um, because we lived in harmony and in balance with the earth. So at this point in time, there were no unhoused people. We didn't have food insecurities. We lived in community, we lived in villages, and we took care of each other. Um, I think that it's a big mind shift when you think about how or we live today when it comes to like the idea of consumption. Example I like to give is, you know, if there is an acorn tree, we would gather acorns for the entire village, and we had a way of storing them for the enti entire village, and we would eat, and the things would be done as a village. I think that in today's world, if we were dependent on acorns as the staple of our diet, we would think about our families only and care for our families, and we would store for our families as individuals. So the mindset of community versus individual was very different how we used to live versus how we live today. Next slide, please. Um, so pre-colonization, um, you know, Mother Earth was our grocery store, our Target, our Home Depot, and we lived in what was called in place. So when, we, when I say in place, what I mean is because our native people covered such a vast area, if we lived at the beach, what Mother Earth provided for us was very different than if we lived in a mountain community. So in the beach, our diet might have been more fish-based, right, than it would be in the mountain area. And so we definitely would live and use what we had available to us, but we were able to do it in a harmonious way and living and appreciating all the various seasons and what the seasons brought to us, as well as through the waterways and you know, knowing that we could get certain things at certain seasons from the water for basket weaving or homemaking or whatever it might be. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a mural. I'm gonna transition. Um, this is a mural that, was put, that is currently standing in Santa Monica City Hall. And what I wanna do is give you a few minutes just to kind of like observe and soak in this mural and for you to all to maybe think of like one, two, three words in your own mind that you can think of when you see this mural. So this mural was pioneered with a method called petrochome. And Stan, excuse me, I wanna make sure I get his name right. Stanton McDonald Wright, he spent his early years in Santa Monica and he's the artist of this mural. Um, and what he used was petrochome and it's a liquid mi uh, mixture of materials using crushed tile, marble, and granite that dries. So it's very heavy and it sits up on the wall. Well, during the depression that followed the stock market crash in 1929, you know, many banks failed and many Americans were unemployed. And an unintended consequence was that due to economic hardships, museums had an all-time record high attendance. And so art became a thing in America and the W... PA, the Works Project Administration, was something that came about, and this is actually a product of the WPA. And as a matter of that, um, that that's how this was created. So if you can fast forward with me to May 2021, the Santa Monica City Council directed staff to install a cover over the mural. Fast forward again to February 2022, and they canceled the directive for the mural to be covered. And during that time, this is a quote from a council, council member. It looks like Native Americans are being subservient to the Spaniards, so it kind of adds to subservancy, and then also adds being a savage. So I think we can do better than that, and I'm really looking forward to community engagement about how we can address whether it's a plaque, an expl explanation, or whatever that might be. I think about this in terms of what I shared with you guys in the original reading about the parts of the body and how this was created from an individual perspective at that time that was probably very true, but it took the perspective of maybe a foot or his eye, um, but not necessarily inclusive of the whole body. During the 1930s, the Pico neighborhood in Santa Monica was known as a crown jewel for people of color, specifically African Americans, and it still um, exists today, yet people of color are not represented in the mural of Santa Monica. In addition to that, if you look at the mural, and you can up close, it's kind of hard to see in this view, but just to share, Native Americans and the woman do not have eyes, yet everybody else has eyes. 
um, the, there's only one woman that's depicted as well. So all of that is, it's, it's hard when you start, you know, paying attention to some of the additional details. So, little tangent, um, I was asked to be a part of the community group that the city council person referred to, to actually look at the mural and give recommendations. And so the group met for about a year, and um, it was a very, eclectic group um, of people with various personalities, perspectives, backgrounds, and it was one of the most fascinating experience I personally have participated in with community taking part and learning from each other of different perspectives. And so the outcome of what we came up with, we really don't know yet. It's gonna be shared with city council in November, um, so next month, and we'll get to see the full report when it gets shared with city council. However, I suspect the, based on the sentiment of how the group worked, I suspect that it will likely be recommended that something different is done with it rather than it stay there just because of the amount of people that it omits as opposed to the lack of inclusivity that it, it, it has today. So, um, continuing on, let's see. I, next slide, yeah, this one I just put up there because I think it's a fun way of sharing that we all have different perspectives and with our different perspectives, sometimes they can lead or have a more lasting impression like a piece of art that's been up there for almost 100 years, you know, versus what's the impact that we have with our own individual perspectives and the conversations that we have or the groups that we're a part of and how we share and how we show up. And in that manner, I thought it would be really important to talk about land acknowledgements. So, um, if you will, Bear with me, I, what I wanted to do was really talk about how a land acknowledgement offers a perspective and it sets a tone. And land acknowledgements are something, obviously you guys are all familiar with it because you guys do it every Sunday. Um, but you also participate in other groups in other areas. And our land acknowledgements being done, some places yes, some places no, some people don't even know what a land acknowledgement is, who can give it, or anything like that. So what I wanna do is spend a little bit of time talking about our individual perspective and how it impacts the community at large when you give a land acknowledgement and what that's intended for. So as I mentioned, our history is complicated. And one thing that a land acknowledgement does is that it forces people to have a little bit more awareness as to what our complicated history is in stating the native land that you're on. It's a statement of recognizing native people and the historical impact that has happened to the people that have, ha that have inhabited and reside on this land. It's also a way of showing connection from the past to the present. And ideally, when a land acknowledgement is given, is that it's more than just words, and it's putting in place a partnership of showing or saying things that you will do different or better to live in harmony with the land. So the question I get often is, who can do a land acknowledgement? Well, if Mike and I did it, it would be a land welcoming, because we would be welcoming you to our ancestral land. But if someone that's not native does it, it's called a land acknowledgement, because you're acknowledging the land that you're on. And ideally, someone that does a land acknowledgement, anyone can do one, but ideally, it's somebody that has taken the time to do a little bit of research about the ancestral land that they're on, maybe some contributions, or know something about the people or the land. So then I get the question, why should we do a land acknowledgement? And what I would say is that reconciliation is necessary. It's healing and it's important. And it acknowledges the intentions of stating that we want justice for all. It addresses the historical and ongoing just injustices that were done to Native people and helps elevate the voices of Native Americans. I also think that it's a matter of education because it begs questions and hard conversations as well. Our history is typically not well taught in schools, and that's a problem. I know that when I went into school, and similar to what Robin had shared, I was told we were extinct. Clearly, we're not. <laughs> um, so I think that a land acknowledgement demonstrates some cultural respect, and it really just amplifies the voices for a positive change in going forward. Um, LA County has a land acknowledgement. We worked with the city of Monterey Park as well as the city of Cudahy to develop a, a land acknowledgement as well. Um, another thing I wanna share with you guys, and it's out there on the social justice table, but there is a book called We Are Here that our tribe worked with to, and what it does is it documents 
the histories and harms that were done to our people in LA County, and it's also available on the link tree as well, because um, there's a QR code out there. But it's a good read if you want to know more about our people in a concise manner. I would definitely recommend that. Next slide, please. Okay. So, as I've said before, and I say again, um, we are here, and our people hold cultural and a spiritual connection to the land. Um, one fun thing that I want to share that's recent um, is some of you may have written letters on our behalf for an assembly bill called Assembly Bill 776. And what it was was to rename the 210 freeway. So the 210 freeway was a path that our ancestors took that many people do not know. And obviously now it's a freeway that we all drive on. Most of us probably drove on it to get to here today, right? <laughs> well, thanks to Assemblyman Chris Bolt Holden, he introduced a bill to rename it the Southern California Native American Highway. And through each respective area, it will have the tribal land's name. So it starts in Fernandeño to Tavium. The majority of the freeway is Gavilino Tongva, and it ends in Serrano. Well, I'm so excited to say that Governor Newsom signed that bill on Indigenous Peoples Day this week. So, yay! <laughs> so, you know, as much as representation matters, ensuring that we're electing officials that have native voice or native awareness is important as well. Um, so in closing, what I really want to just say is Equishem, we are here, and I leave you with this. Um, my ask is that you evaluate your own perspectives and challenge yourself. When you think about the various communities that you participate in, when you're in connection with other people, how can you share a different perspective and how can you help raise your own voice or the voice of others that are not represented? Thank you. Our closing hymn is number 123 in your gray hymnal or on the screen. Uh, screens above. Please rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing Spirit of Life in English and in Spanish. Now it's time for the benediction and blessing. I do really want to take time to thank Virginia, Robin, um, Deidre, the Social Justice Committee, Zaneda, and Reverend Omega for letting us share this time and space together. I really appreciate the opportunity. As we close, please receive the benediction and prayer. May the grace of understanding be upon you with wisdom. 
May you see through the lens of empathy, knowing each other carries a unique perspective woven by experience. May you cherish community, recognizing the variety of voices that live in our own humanity. May your heart be open, your mind receptive, and your spirit be in harmony with the environment and land. May you find the strength in diversity, and may our differences be gifts that positively contribute to our respective communities. May the creator of compassion and understanding bless you, keep you in community and connection with each other. As we go, receive the blessing inspired by an Apache prayer. Looking behind, we are filled with gratitude. Looking forward, we're filled with visions of loving one another. Looking upward, we're filled with strength and light. Looking within, may we discover peace and courage to love one another and gain new perspectives. Amen. Thank you. Anyway, this uh, second version of Raven, we're just going to jazz it up. How many of you knew that the freeways, today's freeways, are foot trails that our people used? Well, they were all connected to villages and for trading and everything. I just had to get that in there. So.
Thank you. Thank you.